Questions about historical facts often come up in my conversations with people interested in discovering France. This section is my attempt at giving you an overview of the history of France in a structured timeline, providing points of references and explaining some specific events which I think are important. Also, as I'm sure you've all heard of some French landmarks or even visited them, but without necessarily being clear about what exactly they were built, in what context and what they meant. So here, I'll put things in perspective a bit, I'll describe the history of France around the seven period timeline, and I'll go on to explain some landmarks, including the Eiffel Tower, which you know, and the Lascaux Cave, which maybe you've never heard of. In essence, I guess I've written a 7,000 word story of my perception of French history, which I'm about to tell you. History is kind of organic, isn't it? In 987, at the turn of the first millennium, what was called France, the actual bit of territory controlled by the king, was less than 2% of what's now France. That was following the dislocation 500 years earlier of Roman Gaul, which was part of the Western Roman Empire, which itself was attacked and destroyed by so-called barbarians coming from elsewhere in Europe, who carved little kingdoms of their own around the French space, hence the situation. The then king of France in 987 was little more than a title-holding nobility amongst the other nobles controlling the other regions, the Duke of Burgundy, the Duke of Brittany, the Earl of Toulouse, and others whom they elected, yep, election, that was a thing at the time, as king, because they recognized his moral authority, albeit sometimes quite reluctantly. 800 years later, when came the time of the French Revolution, after a lot of fighting, a lot of politicking, and a lot of weddings too, current France was put together. Well, just a few bits were still missing, like the Nice area in the south of France and Savoie in the Alps, but never mind. 250 years later, during the 20th century, Nazi Germany tried to rebuild an empire based on race, of which France was meant to be part, and later in 1957, France was a founding member of the European Union, which some would like to be a democratic empire of some sort. To put things in context, because I'm not going to discuss this in the timeline, it's important to keep in mind that due in good part to its location, modern France is the very definition of a melting pot, more so than the USA really. Roughly speaking, there were two big immigration waves in French history. The first one is the barbarians' invasions 2,000 years ago, and the second is at the end of the 19th century at the start of the Industrial Revolution. Amongst the famous French immigrants, we have Leonardo da Vinci, who was invited into France by François Ier, the Nobel Prize winner Marie Curie, who was Polish, and Pablo Picasso, who was born in Spain. The French language is an important part of its history, or rather, the way it came about. You won't be surprised to hear that it clearly descends from Latin, which was historically used for all literature and official documents throughout Europe. Another crucial influence on France was the Frankish language. As the Roman Empire declined, Gaul was repeatedly invaded by Germanic tribes from the east, including the Franks, hence the name, by the way. French as a language first appeared in writing in 842, then in religious writings in the 10th century, and French literature, which didn't take off until the late 12th century. Obviously, until French was the common lingua all across the territory, people stuck to their local dialects and Latin. Anyway, territory, people, language, that's the perspective. So now we're ready to build all this into a timeline. Prehistory usually refers to the time period before the advent of written records, spanning from the earliest human occupation to the establishment of Celtic societies around 600 before Christ. So here, I am pushing it a bit as this first period ends when the Gauls meet the Greeks and are ready to be swallowed by the Romans. But please indulge me. During the last Ice Age, most of the humans living in France were called cro -Magnon. They dwelt in caves and hunted animals such as mammoth and reindeer. They must have been resourceful people because it was harsh to survive in such a pretty tough climate. And they also created art. We know that because we found impressive paintings they made on the walls of caves, the two most famous being Lascaux and Chauvet, both in the south of France. With a warmer climate, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle gradually came to an end. The agricultural revolution, which had begun in the Middle East, made its way to Western Europe about 8,000 years ago, 
However, the change to farming from hunting and gathering took centuries, so for a long time hunting was still an important source of food. Anyhow, by about 4500 before Christ, that 65 centuries ago, the Stone Age farmers had created a pretty sophisticated society. Most of what remains are only impressive stone tombs and erect standing stones known as Menhir. In Brittany, there's a rather stunning collection of them, like of thousands in Karnak. The early farmers used stone tools. About 2000 before Christ, bronze was introduced into France. Then about 900 before Christ, a people called the Celts migrated to France and brought with them iron tools and weapons. At the top of the Celtic society were the aristocrats. Below them were the farmers and craftsmen. By the way, that structure pretty much stayed in place until the French Revolution, a good millennium later. Celtic craftsmen were very skilled workers in iron, bronze, and gold. Trade flourished throughout Gaul, and the Gauls built communities in hill forts known as Opidium. Well, the Romans gave them that name in stock, with lots of them later becoming the first French towns. Then about 600 before Christ, the Greeks founded Marseille in the south of France and Gaul increasingly came into contact with the Mediterranean world. But all along the way, the Gauls were hopelessly disunited. They were divided into about 60 tribes, and that made it easy for the Romans to conquer them. Les Gaulois, remember, were just a bunch of competing tribes, really. So, in 121 before Christ, the Romans managed to conquer what's now the southern Languedoc region of France. And later, Julius Caesar managed to gain control of the entirety of Gaul in 58 before Christ when he defeated Versagetorix. Here is a side note. Caesar has written a whole book about his conquest of Gaul, which to this day is still the main source of info about this period. Not always truthfully, it appears, because it's pretty clear now that the guy was biased and that the whole thing was PR. Weird, if you ask me. But anyway. So, Roman Gaul became quickly a Roman province with a mix of Roman and Celtic influences. La France Gallo-Romaine. The Gallo-Romans built roads, picked Lyon as Gaul's capital, introduced Latin, Roman citizenship, large farming villas and senators. Nîmes and Arles in the south of France are superb witnesses to that time, with great museums about it you should really visit. However, by the mid-3rd century, Rome was in trouble, with economic issues, epidemics and high taxes. The Romans lost control of their empire to Germanic raids just around 400 after Christ. I guess it's fair to say that it's the Romans' own weaknesses that enabled the Germanic tribes to overthrow them. Around 500, the Franks emerged as a leading force, and they conquered all of what's France now within 50 years, and became the French dynasty known as the Merovingians. The name stems from Merovec, a semi-legendary figure, as in there's no proof the guy actually existed, whose mother is supposed to have been impregnated by a sea monster. One thing's for sure, Merovec's mother was the real-life wife of the King Claudio, who was an ancestor of the King Clovis, who converted to Christianity, merging Frankish and Gallo-Roman cultures. That Merovingian dynasty had limited power, though, with lots of regions retaining their authority. The Merovingians were later replaced by the Carolingians, whose main figure is Charlemagne, hence the name's dynasty, which is derived from the Latin Carolus, meaning Charles. He wanted to unite Christianity and created a new European empire stretching east well into current Germany, which he called the Holy Roman Empire. But alas, after his death in 814, it was divided up among his sons. Viking raids in Normandy in the north in the 8th and 10th centuries, barbarians again, weakened the French king's control, leading to regional fragmentation and increasing autonomy in the south and in Brittany. In 911, one of Charlemagne's sons made a treaty with a Viking guy called Rollo, ceding Normandy in exchange for his conversion to Christianity and his loyalty. This episode illustrates how the inability of Charlemagne's sons to resist Viking and Arab invasions in the south, coming from Spain, resulted in local magnates gaining power, leading to the fragmentation of France. Regional authority persisted, especially in the south, setting the stage for the next period of French history. So the Viking threat was contained by assimilation, so to speak. 
But by 987, when Hugues Capet ascended the throne at the death of the last Carolingian, the French king held little sway. Counties and duchies operated independently, with the French king directly controlling only a tiny Parisian area. However, step by step, petit à petit, the kings managed to bring most of France under royal control by the late 13th century. The economy flourished from the late 11th century, with booming trade and vibrant towns, especially in Paris. The arts, architecture, and literature thrived, accompanied by a surge in learning and the establishment of several universities. The Valois dynasty started in 1328, when the Capuchin line ended and Philip became king. But then the Hundred Years' War erupted ten years later, that's the conflict between England and France. The French lost ground until 1360, then it was the English from 1375. In 1392, it appeared that Charles VI, the French king at the time, had lost his mind, which sparked power struggles between two lower-ranking French dukes. The English took advantage, well tried, by forming an alliance with one of them, the one from Burgundy. In 1429, Jeanne d'Arc, Joanne of Arc, emerged. She was a peasant from the east of France, an enigmatic figure, really, and she managed to lead the French forces to victory at Orléans in the south of France on behalf of the Mad King, but she was later captured and executed by the English. By 1453, it was over. The English had retreated, leaving France united under the Valois kings. The latest one married the Duchess of Brittany in 1491, ending regional autonomies. By the end of the 15th century, France emerged as a strong centralized kingdom, having reclaimed Aquitaine, Normandy, Burgundy and other regions, solidifying its status in European history, a kingdom that was going to last another three centuries until the French Revolution. In the early 16th century, France prospered with a growing population increasingly unified around, among other things, the French language itself, which became official in 1539. But things changed for the worse in the second half of the century, with France facing poor harvests and epidemics, and around the same time conflicts arising with Italy, which were settled in 1559, and then, following the emergence of Protestantism in 1541, they called it Calvinism at the time, in 1562, an ugly religion-based civil war erupted, with, in Paris, the Saint Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, La Nuit de la saint Barthélemy, the most tragic event. And finally, it was over thanks to one of the greatest French kings, Henry IV, Henri IV, who granted religious freedom in 1598 with his Edit de Nantes, an edict published, well, in Nantes. From then on, in the 17th century, the French kings built the absolute monarchy. Louis XIV, Louis XIV, Henry IV's grandson, made it very clear when, in 1661, aged only 23, he fired all of his ministers and decided to rule everything himself. That's the famous l'état c'est moi, which means, well, I am the state. To make sure that people got the message, he made sure to be known and portrayed as le roi soleil, the sun king. While he was building Versailles, the Sun King had to manage a 30-year war with Austria and Spain, which the French won, but at the cost of internal economic trouble and uprisings due to heavy taxes levied to finance the never-ending war. Then in 1685, the King, under the influence of his mistress at the time, it said, revoked the religious freedom which caused economic strain and mass emigration, sending thousands of French Protestants across the world in Europe, but also to the Americas or South Africa, for example. Louis XIV died in 1714. In the 18th century, France experienced prosperity with an increased population, an expanding middle class and growing trade, including the slave trade that massively enriched the seashore cities in France like Nantes, Bordeaux or Saint-Malo. Then, France got embroiled in the Seven Year Wars from 1756, which maybe was the first global war, as it involved the other great powers of the time, Great Britain, Austria, Prussia and Russia, and was primarily caused by disputes in or about all the new colonies that the Europeans had carved for themselves far from Europe, which is probably why France later supported American colonies in their rebellion to get rid of Britain from 1775. At home, in towns and cities, new ideas emerged. Rationalism flourished, 
with thinkers like Voltaire and Diderot challenging the power of the Catholic Church as well as that of the traditional institutions, including the monarchy, which paved the way for the French Revolution starting in 1789 after the king at the time, Louis XVI, had the poor idea of trying to impose new taxes again, partly to pay for the wars abroad again. By then, France had grown into a dominant European power, with Great Britain, really, but faced dramatic economic and political challenges. La Révolution Française, such momentous changes, that this was a relatively short period of time, intense social and political upheaval from 1789 to 1815. Here I'm combining the Revolution and Napoleon times because one stems from the other, really. The monarchy was abolished, replaced by a radical group who were themselves replaced by Napoleon Bonaparte, who crowned himself emperor, and the monarchy was restored in 1815 after Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo. Oof, all in 26 years. We usually think 1789. But actually, it all started really in 1786, when the king's advisor suggested the introduction of a new tax on land and a stamp tax. The advisor first convinced the king to call the Council of Notables to try and obtain their support. And when that didn't work, les états généraux, a four-show only elected body which had not met in 170 years. But the king refused and decided to push through with the measures anyway, which led to uproars across the entire country. So in July 1788, the king caved in, but his timing was unlucky because the harvests of 1787 and 1788 had been poor and bread was expensive, so the people were in an ugly mood. After a lot of bickering in the council and very poor politics by the king, the third estate, which represented the ordinary people, so not the clergy, and not the nobles, lost patience. And in June 1789, they declared themselves the true representatives of the people of France and were joined by the clergy. The king didn't like it and sent the troops. And while the king was hiding in Versailles, 10 miles away, the people stormed the Bastille prison in Paris. Hence Bastille Day on July 14th. So, the National Assembly had been born and the revolutionary enacted significant reforms including abolishing feudal privileges and adopting the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Economic struggles persisted, and the king attempted to escape France, which infuriated the opposition and even some of his supporters too. In 1792, war with Austria and Prussia intensified, leading to the abolition of the monarchy when the National Assembly decided to take matters in its own hands. The radical phase ensued with the rise of the Jacobins and the execution of the king and his wife. The revolution's extreme phase saw mass executions. Between 20 and 40,000 people were killed across the country. All came to a halt in 1799 when Napoleon Bonaparte staged a coup, ending the revolution and ushering in a new era. Napoleon decided that the National Assembly would be replaced by a triad, a group of three consuls, like the Romans, of which he was going to be the first, obviously. He made sure that his group's authority was stamped in, in a constitution approved by popular referendum, and over time he extended his rule, becoming consul for life in 1802, and then crowning himself, why not, emperor in 1804. While preserving some revolutionary principles, such as legal equality, Napoleon curtailed press freedom and implemented censorship and centralized bureaucracy around his important civil code, which is still in use today. Despite military successes over Austria, Russia, and Prussia, naval defeats like Trafalgar hampered Napoleon's plans to invade Britain. In 1812, his failed Russian invasion marked a turning point, leading to further defeats and his first abdication and exile on a small island near Corsica. A bit later, he tried to stage a return, but the whole thing lasted only three months, 100 days, and ended in another defeat at Waterloo and another abdication, after which the Brits sent him on a small island in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific, where he died in 1821. 
The 19th century was marked by political instability with industrialization and the emergence of the bourgeoisie, all famously illustrated by Victor Hugo in Les Miserables. There was the July monarchy, a second republic, a second empire, three abdications, and finally the third republic, which lasted until the Second World War. So here we go. In 1815, Napoleon was replaced by the 60-year-old Louis, number 18, brother of the last king and grandson of Louis XIV. Louis kept a constitution in place, even though that wasn't really part of the monarchy's DNA, and tried to restrain those who wanted to completely undo the revolution. They called themselves the ultra-royalists. When Louis died in 1824, he was replaced by his brother Charles, who was convinced he ruled by divine rights and, unlike his brother, had no intention of compromising with the liberals who wanted to keep some of the reforms in place. Not surprisingly, that provoked an uprising after six years and he was forced to abdicate. In 1830, Louis-Philippe became king, no number this time, maybe to express a new approach to power. He lasted 18 years. Under him and his so-called July monarchy, the French constitution was made more liberal. More people were allowed to vote, although still only upper-class men, as the middle classes and the workers were still excluded. After lots of efforts, the French gained control of the whole of Algeria, the first of the colonies. Although France remained a mainly agricultural country, there were a lot more urban workers who faced dreadful conditions during industrialization and started to be influenced by socialist ideas. Economic crisis in 1846 and 1847 fueled discontent, culminating in another revolution in early 1848 and Louis-Philippe abdication, followed by turmoil and unrest during the summer. In November 1848, the new constitution allowed all men to vote, who swiftly elected a single assembly who elected a president, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte himself, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, who, in the footsteps of his uncle, led a coup to become Emperor Napoleon III in 1852. Against all odds, his reign brought urban renovations organized by the Baron Haussmann, who transformed Paris and created its large avenues, industrial growth, and also political liberalization with workers given the right to strike. That was a good job, but it included foreign policy blunders, including in 1870 a war with Prussia, which led, well, to another abdication, the third in the century. Confirmed in 1875, after five years of turmoil following the lost war to Prussia, the Third Republic, the first was during the revolution, the second in 1848, the Third Republic lasted until 1940, 70 years in all, which is quite an achievement. In the late 19th century, industrialization in France continued, iron and chemical industries grew rapidly and more railways were built, living standards for ordinary French people improved and their diet became way better. The Eiffel Tower was built in 1889, and in 1900, a law was passed limiting women and children to working no more than 10 hours a day. Another achievement. And colonial expansion continued full steam ahead. The early years of the 20th century stretch until 1914, until the war. It's called La Belle Époque. These years were years of relative peace and prosperity. France experienced cultural flourishing with advancements in literature, art, and technology. But the Dreyfus Affair from 1894 to 1906, about an army officer wrongfully accused of treason and the cover-up that followed, highlighted social tensions and issues of anti-Semitism. Also, in 1906, France passed a law separating church from the state. It's the French concept of laïcité. The years after the First World War are called Les Années Folles, which does not mean the Roaring Twenties, how it's translated anyway. Paris, particularly around Montparnasse, became an artistic and intellectual hub. Literary movements emerged, thanks to surrealism. The fashion scene was radically transformed with flappers, women behaving and dressing unconventionally, became iconic fixtures of the time. French society modernized with, among other things, the spread of radio and the introduction of cars. It got wealthier with the middle class expanding and more and more leisure activities leading to a reshaping of the cultural landscape, partly thanks to an influx of American culture with films, music, lots of jazz, as well as literature, think Hemingway. But at the same time, France faced serious challenges. 
The depression triggered by the 1929 Wall Street crash reached France from 1932, which led to high unemployment and political tensions, including labor strikes and ideological clashes. In 1939, the French army was swiftly destroyed shortly after the Second World War began, and soon enough Germany occupied much of the territory, with 86-year-old Maréchal Pétain as a German puppet with dictatorial powers collaborating with the Nazis and implementing anti-Jewish measures. France's resources were drained and widespread malnutrition ensued. In 1944, the Allied forces led by the Americans liberated the country with a bit of help from internal French resistance groups and then 54-year-old Charles de Gaulle, then a low-ranking general, became provisional president. In 1947, a new constitution was enacted, which Charles de Gaulle didn't like, so he resigned. Despite a succession of weak governments in the Fourth Republic, France rapidly recovered economically, and by 1951, industrial production had reached its pre-war level. In the 1950s, conflicts arose in the colonies, in Vietnam first and then in Nigeria. In 1958, a crisis erupted there, leading to a coup by French colonists. Facing the threat of civil war, in June of 1958, the National Assembly granted emergency powers to Charles de Gaulle who later orchestrated a successful referendum to approve a new constitution, number five, still in place, including expanded presidential powers. In the end, Algeria and Vietnam and all the other colonies regained their independence. Charles de Gaulle was narrowly re-elected in 1965, but resigned in 1969 after he lost a referendum, and then he died in 1970. Georges Pompidou succeeded Charles de Gaulle, replaced at his death by Valéry Giscard d'Estaing in 1974. Economic challenges emerged in the 1970s in France like everywhere else, with rising inflation and unemployment. François Mitterrand's 1981 election marked a sort of socialist shift, which only lasted two years until economic difficulties led to devaluations and wage freezes and spending cuts. Mitterrand's 1988 re-election preceded Jacques Chirac's presidency in 1995. Nicolas Sarkozy was elected in 2007, followed by François Hollande, and then Emmanuel Macron, the current president, who was elected in 2017. In 1957, France was one of the founding members of the European Union. In 1999, France joined the euro currency. France's legal system, laws and structure are now heavily influenced by what gets decided at European level. But there is no European integration, not really, which is, well, increasingly creating economic and political difficulties and tensions. With around 40,000 officially classified historic monuments marking the history of France, the country has one of the densest concentrations of historic landmarks in the world. From Roman era ruins to post-World War II memorials, these sites in France are key to understanding the country's rich and complicated past. So, I have selected a few for you, which I will explain in more details. First, a teaser. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Les Châteaux de Versailles et de Chambord, as well as with the Eiffel Tower, and probably Le Mont Saint-Michel. They are landmarks I'm convinced you know. Well, familiar, as in you've heard about them or visited them even. Then there is La Prison de la Bastille, which is not a landmark any longer. You just can't visit it. It's been destroyed. But it's pretty important for the French, and you obviously know about Bastille Day. Well, that's where it all starts. It. Also, there is a landmark which is a tapestry. Well, now... It's got its own dedicated museum, so I guess there is a landmark. Anyway, that tapestry is 70 meters long, was made almost a thousand years ago, and explains, among other things, how the English language is just French mispronounced, as the linguist recently explained. Then there is Le Pont du Gard, which is such an engineering marvel by the Romans that engineers today have a hard time understanding how they did it almost 2,000 years ago. And it all starts with caves painted by the first people of France 20,000 years ago in the south of the country. So, well, follow the guide. The Lascaux Cave and the Chauvet Cave are both renowned for their Paleolithic paintings, which provides valuable glimpses into prehistoric human artistry. 
but there are significant differences between the two, ranging from the age of the caves to the style of the artwork. So, let's see. The Lascaux cave is located in Dordogne in the southwestern France. It was discovered in 1940 by a group of teenagers then closed to the public in 1963 to prevent deterioration caused by human activity, with a replica called Lascaux 2, opened nearby in 1983 to allow visitors to experience the artwork in a controlled environment. The cave paintings date back to the Upper Paleolithic period, around 15 to 17,000 years ago. The caves are adorned with over 600 paintings and 1,500 engravings, featuring a variety of animals such as horses, aurochs, deer, and bulls. Human figures and abstract symbols are also present. The artists at Lasco employed various techniques like stenciling, shading, and perspective to create vibrant and uh, realistic representations of animals. The exact purpose of the cave art remains speculative, with theories suggesting religious, shamanic, ritualistic, educational, or storytelling significance. Anything, really. The Chauvet Cave is located in Ardèche, in southern France, equidistant from Lyon and Toulouse. It was discovered in 1994 by three spelelunkers. It was closed very quickly to the public, with a replica opened in 2015. The cave paintings are older than those at Lascaux, dating back to approximately 30 to 32,000 years ago. The cave art includes more than 1,000 drawings of animals such as lions, mammoths, rhinoceroses and horses. The depictions are characterized by a high level of naturalism and detailed rendering. The artists at Chauvet employed various techniques, including finger lottings, drawn contours, and delicate shading, showcasing a sophisticated understanding of artistic expression. The purpose of the cave is also subject to speculation, with theories ranging from ritualistic or symbolic meanings to impressions of artistic prowess. Chauvet, well, Chauvet too, receives 400,000 visitors annually, and the better-known Lasco II receives over half a million visitors every year. Le Pont du Gard is a 2,000-year-old aqueduct bridge located in the south of France, 20 kilometers north of Nîmes, which is part of a larger Roman aqueduct system built to transport water over 50 kilometers from the town of Uzès in Languedoc to the city of Nemosus, modern-day Nîmes. It was built by Roman engineers using limestone blocks without the use of mortar during the reign of Emperor Augustus between 40 and 60 after Christ. The bridge spans the Garden River and consists of three tiers of arches reaching a height of 49 meters, which is 160 feet. The bottom tier served as a road bridge, while the two upper tiers supported the water channel. It's a remarkable engineering marvel because the spring in Rousses, from which the water was diverted, is only 17 meters higher than the fountain in Nîmes where the water was delivered after flowing out over 50 kilometers. That's a 0.034% slope, a little over 3% of 1%. How did the Roman manage that? Despite its ancient origins, Le Pont du Gard has survived remarkably well. The structure's solid design allows it to withstand the region's strong seasonal floods. In the Middle Ages, the bridge was adapted for pedestrian and vehicular use, and a small castle was built on the top tier. Nowadays, only the pedestrian use remains, and people can't access the top tier. Two millenniums after it was built, Le Pont du Gard is a popular tourist attraction, drawing about a million visitors a year. Tourists can explore the surroundings of the bridge, walk along its lower tier, and enjoy the typical lower Mediterranean forest around it called La Garrigue. The site includes a museum that provides insights into Roman aqueduct technology and the local environment. And Le Pont du Gard also hosts various cultural events and activities contributing to its continued popularity. The Bayeux Tapestry is certainly the most famous tapestry in the world. It is an embroidery from the 11th century, 70 meters in length by 50 centimeters wide, which represents the Norman conquest of England by William the Conqueror. Put into context, it's also an important testament to a complex interplay of influences between France and England, ranging from the conquest and conflict to cultural exchange and linguistic evolution.
The tapestry was commissioned in 1077 by the Bishop of Bayeux in Normandy to adorn the city's cathedral. It was almost destroyed during the French Revolution, but today an entire museum is dedicated to the tapestry and to King William, or shall I say, Le Duc Guillaume. It's frequently said that this tapestry is the first comic strip in history. The work was done with needle on linen using wools of four different colors. After an introduction in Latin, historical scenes, battles, and daily life follow one another, with more than 600 characters represented, as many real as mythological animals, boats, and buildings do. Born in 1028, Guillaume, Duke of Normandy, was a descendant of the Viking chief who became the first ruler of Normandy after signing a treaty with the Frankish king Charles, son of Charlemagne, in 911. In 1066, when the English King Edward died without an heir, Harold, his brother-in-law, quickly grabbed the power. But Guillaume in Normandy claimed the crown based on earlier discussions with Edward. After a few months, he crossed the channel with an army and defeated Harold in Hastings and was crowned King of England two months later in London. It has to be said that it took him five more years to conquer and pacify the rest of the country. That victory is why, during the following five centuries, Old French, Anglo-Saxon at the time, was the language of the ruling class in England, from the courts and churches to the aristocracy. At the same time across the land, the lower classes spoke Old English, hence the mix. Until this day, the French language remains the source of words and expressions in English. As a matter of fact, even though it's a Germanic language, in contrast to French, which is a Romance language, about 41% of everyday English words today originate from French, and only 33% come from Anglo-Saxon, which became German. The Plantagenet kings who succeeded the Normans, William's dynasty, had extensive lands in both England and France, including territories like Gascony and Aquitaine, and this situation led to ongoing conflicts and tensions, and later the Hundred Years' War, until 1453. Le Mont Saint-Michel is a 12th century old medieval abbey perched on a rocky island between Brittany and Normandy in northwestern France. It's often referred to as one of the marvels of the Western world because of the architectural challenge that it represents, so much so that the Mont and the bay it sits in have been featured in numerous films, including the famous Cloister in the Air. The abbey's construction began in the 8th century, spurred by a vision allegedly experienced by a priest, the bishop of nearby Avranches, which is 15 kilometers south. The bishop was supposedly instructed by the archangel Michael to build a church on the island. Initially, it was a small church, and over the centuries, it evolved into a magnificent abbey complex, combining military architecture with religious functions, with its location on a rocky island making it a formidable fortress. The abbey includes a remarkable abbey church, a refectory, and various other buildings. It became a prominent pilgrimage site during the Middle Ages, drawing visitors from across Europe. It was also a center of learning and housed a thriving monastic community. Le Mans' strategic location made it a symbol of resistance during the Hundred Years' War as it withstood multiple sieges. Today, Le Mont Saint-Michel attracts 2 million visitors. The island is accessible by a causeway during low tide and a shuffle service during high tide. Visitors' experience includes exploring the Abbey, wandering through charming narrow streets lined with shops and restaurants, and enjoying panoramic views of the bay from the top. Le Château de Chambord is a magnificent Renaissance castle located in the Loire-et-Cher department of the Loire Valley in France, right in the center of the country. Construction began in 1519 and lasted several decades. The primary force behind its creation was François I, King Francis I, who envisaged the château as both a hunting lodge, he loved hunting, and a symbol of his power and wealth. He came up with the ideas and commissioned Domenico da Cortona, an Italian Renaissance architect, to build it. Chambord stands as a testament to Renaissance innovation and artistry. The castle features a harmonious blend of French medieval forms and classical Italian structures, distinctive French defensive towers, an unparalleled architectural symmetry, and also a unique architectural wonder. A central double helix staircase, probably designed by Leonardo da Vinci. Double 
because the idea was that you could climb to the top while riding a horse and wave to another horse-riding guest coming down on the same staircase. The castle is also adorned with a remarkable 365 turret each, representing a day of the year, I guess, 440 rooms, 282 fireplaces, and over 70 staircases on top of the large one. It's a rather large house. Chambord's construction unfolded during a time of intense rivalry among European monarchs, each vying for supremacy. The chateau was intended to showcase the monarch's grandeur and power, even if said monarch only stayed there 71 days over his 32-year reign. It's still used today as such by the French presidents, with a castle surrounded by an enormous estate encompassing a game reserve and hunting grounds spanning over 13,000 acres. As one of the most recognizable castles in the world, Le Chateau de Chambord attracts visitors from across the globe. Annually, it welcomes just under 1.2 million tourists and hosts cultural events, exhibitions showcasing art, history, and the cultural heritage of the region known for its many other historic castles, vineyards, and landscapes. Le Chateau de Versailles, well... It's a palace, actually, substantially larger than Buckingham Palace, is located 10 miles southwest of Paris. It's an unparalleled symbol of grandeur and opulence, and it played a pivotal role in French history. Construction began in 1661 under the helm of Louis XIV. Actually, his idea was to enlarge a hunting lodge built by his dad, and then it became the grandiose residence it is today to centralize and illustrate his power and authority. The best craftsmen worked on it. Architect Louis Leveau, landscape architect André Le Nôtre, and painter decorator Charles Lebrun, who were all masters of their times. Versailles is a masterpiece of Baroque architecture with ornate facades, grand courtyards, and exquisite interior decor. Standing out is the 73 meters long hall of mirrors, La Galerie des Glaces, breathtaking with 17 mirrored arches reflecting the palace gardens adorned with 357 mirrors. The palace also boasts a royal opera house, the Opéra Royal, designed a little later for Louis XV in the 18th century. It's surrounded by meticulously landscaped gardens covering approximately 800 hectares, that's about 2,000 acres, featuring ground fountains, sculpted hedges, and statues. Just like Chambord two centuries earlier, the construction of Versailles unfolded during a period of intense political maneuvering and a desire for absolute monarchy in France. Louis XIV strategically moved the royal court from Paris to Versailles, creating a symbol of absolute power and control. The palace also served as a venue for entertaining foreign dignitaries and asserting France's dominance on the European stage, and it still does under Emmanuel Macron. Long after Louis XIV, it was a setting for the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, officially ending the First World War. Today, the palace is also where the two French assemblies meet when there is a need to modify the French constitution because it boasts a large room large enough to seat 900 people. Versailles is the third most visited historical sites in the world after the Forbidden City in China and Lincoln's Memorial in Washington, D.C., attracting over 8 million visitors annually. Don't go looking for it. You won't find it. That prison was destroyed on July 14, 1789. Yep, that's it. Bastille Day. The Bastille Prison was a fortress and state prison located inside Paris, where La Place de la Bastille is now, known for its use by the Bourbon kings to detain political prisoners. I want to explain the significance of what happened then. In the months leading up to the storming of La Bastille, France was experiencing widespread social and economic unrest. The common people were facing economic hardship, and there was a sense of frustration with the monarchy's perceived indifference to the plight of the masses. La Bastille had come to symbolize the tyranny and despotism of the monarchy. It was seen as a symbol of arbitrary royal power, and its storming became a powerful statement against the oppressive rule of the king. Rumors had spread that La Bastille contained a stockpile of weapons and gunpowder which the people believed could be used against them. This fueled the desire to seize the fortress and secure these resources for the revolutionary cause. The storming of La Bastille served as a catalyst that intensified the 
revolutionary fervor and encouraged people across the country to rise against the monarchy. In the aftermath of that storming, the National Constituent Assembly adopted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, asserting the fundamental rights and freedoms of the people. That's why the storming of this old prison is often considered the beginning of the revolution and the end of absolute monarchy in France, and is celebrated as such and remains an iconic and historic moment that symbolizes the power of the people to fight for their rights and freedom. La Tour Eiffel is as iconic a symbol as they come, in the same league as New York and its Big Apple, I guess. The tower is both synonymous with the City of Light and a testament to engineering marvel. Erected alongside the Seine River, the tower is a steel and iron structure designed by the civil engineer Gustave Eiffel and his construction company for the 1889 Exposition Universelle, the World's Fair. Its design was absolutely revolutionary at the time. Standing at 324 meters, over a thousand feet, the tower held the title of the tallest man-made structure in the world until the completion of the Chrysler Building in New York in 1930. It is made of over 18,000 individual iron parts held together by over 2.5 million rivets. The tower showcases a remarkable blend of aesthetics and engineering, although the aesthetics aspect took a bit of convincing. While initially met with mixed reviews, the tower later garnered admiration for its innovation and design. The construction took place during a period marked by optimism, technological advancement, and cultural dynamism. Its completion marked the centennial celebration of the French Revolution, symbolizing progress and industrial prowess. Intended as a temporary structure, the Eiffel Tower was nearly dismantled after the World's Fair. However, it was quickly repurposed as a telecommunication tower, saving it from demolition. A fun fact, Gustave Eiffel created a secret apartment at the top of the tower, well, almost, at 295 meters, where he had his office and received guests and friends. A not-so-fun fact, about 10 people tried to throw themselves from the tower every year, and about 370 died on it or from it since it was built either by suicide or by accident. The Eiffel Tower attracts over 7 million visitors annually, making it one of the most visited paid monuments, because you have to pay to climb, in contrast to Versailles, for example. Its observation desks offer panoramic views of Paris, and the tower is renowned for its stunning nighttime illuminations, including political messages sometimes, and is often the backdrop to some of the most sumptuous firework events in the world. 